time is creeping up on us, and I'd like to take us back to those fearless medics at the 405th Combat Support Hospital and see just how they're doing. So let's take it to the 405th. Colonel No. Colonel Cooper. Colonel Cooper, the PMO. Glad you could come. What have we got here? Well, I'm very worried that we have an infectious process going on. We have a number of patients from the same unit. They all have pneumonia, uh, fever, chills. They all have hemoptysis. A number of the patients have hemorrhagic rash, petechiae, uh, purpura. And from the history from these patients, it seems it affects a almost entire unit. Um, I'm very, very concerned we have a significant outbreak here. Well, we've been getting uh, DNBI surveillance reports from units all over the area uh, here all day long, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that they seem to have in common. Uh, why don't we take a look at the patients and see if we can uh, flesh out uh, uh, what their symptoms are in common, and uh, in the meantime, just continue your appropriate therapies. Okay, here's one of our sickest patients here. He's on uh, intravenous rocephin. Uh, IV erythromycin. We've got Roger that. Yes, sir. We'll be looking Folks, for Folks, bring us. it in. Yeah, what's going on? Well, you definitely have an outbreak here. The patients all have very similar symptoms. They're from the same unit. Uh, and we, we haven't got an exact attack rate yet, uh, but I'm going to assemble my team and start a full outbreak investigation. Sounds really bad. Just talked to the division surgeon. Uh, told him that we have a significant outbreak here of an infectious process. Um, he told me that there's at least 10 more patients due in from the battalion aid stations with similar symptoms. So uh, we've got a big problem here. Well, it sounds like somebody's got to write standing orders on these patients, so I'll take the responsibility for that. Sir, shouldn't we separate these patients from the trauma cases? That's yeah, a good idea. Why don't we cohort isolate them uh, separate from those patients and make sure that the staff uses protective masks and universal precautions caring for them. We can use ICW-2. I'll go get the medics to prepare for standing orders. Great. Okay. Dr. Cooper, um, some of these patients are very seriously ill. Uh, we got them on rocephin, we have them on erythromycin. Um, is there anything else that we can do while we're waiting the cultures, or do you have any idea what's going on here? Well, we don't have an agent yet, but uh, uh, there's been some disturbing reports from some of the troops. They said they were shelled a couple of nights ago. The shells didn't explode, but made a hissing sound. What do you think that means? Well, it could mean that this is an intentional event. Uh, there's been no reports of civilian illness, no animal die-offs from the ESO. I'll uh, have the uh, M check with the MBC officer about bids alerts and see if they've been uh, confirmed by the Tamil. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll uh, check the culture reports and check on some of these patients. Some of them look pretty ill. All right. And I'm going to get on those uh, standing orders right now. Great. Right. Like Let's get moving. Plan. going to be conducting, fellas, two different types of surveillance activities. I'm going to split you into two groups. You two are going to be conducting uh, surveillance, case surveillance activities within the unit uh, uh, here in the hospital unit. And there's your uh, the forms that we're going to work off of. You guys here, we're going to be going out to the involved unit and conducting a surveillance activity there so we can calculate some attack rates. Uh, so two different teams, two different types of, uh, of data collection. This stuff is real important for what we're going to do. Any questions? Sure. Okay, let's split up and do it. We've got our uh, epi curve plotted here. You can see the number of cases uh, plotted over uh, uh, time with the hour of onset uh, of illness. Yeah, what does this line here mean? Well, those are that's the actual number of cases that uh, that occurred around uh, 0730, and it looks like it's about 14 uh, of the cases. Okay, so what do you think of our scenario? What's going on now? Any questions? There was a, there was no animal die-off. Is there any significance to that? Is there a significance to an animal die-off? Um, in, in general, if I understand your question, um, there could be. Uh, and I think uh, you heard some examples uh, from Major Cortipeter about plague. And I like to use the example of Venezuelan equine encephalitis. That's a disease that typically affects equines, as the name implies. Uh, if you had a horse die-off or equine die-off uh, and then started to see human uh, cases of encephalitis, uh, that would be the way we would predict that, that would play out naturally. On the other hand, if Venezuela and equine encephalitis were used in a sinister manner, were blown out there in aerosol form intentionally, 
uh, you would expect to see human cases either before or in conjunction with perhaps the equine cases. So sometimes knowing whether there's been an animal die-off or not is helpful. Hope, hope that answers your questions. Uh, so again, it might be a clue of an unnatural event. Now, we've spent time trying to understand how triage applies to the biological battlefield. We've talked about how the epidemiologists do their job and how to help the epidemiologist do his job or her job. We've talked about how to help the laboratorians uh, do their job. Now, while Lieutenant Colonel Cooper, who was acting as the PMO in our scenario, is investigating his outbreak, let's move on to the nuts and bolts of diagnosis and treatment, we'll get down to helping the patient now that we've helped other people. Well, now, great. And, and to help us with our discussion on treatment, we have asked our colleague, uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Christopher, uh, to join us. George is uniquely qualified to speak about this subject. He ha is an infectious disease doc, and he led the working group to develop the Army's doctrine for treating BW casualties in the field. Welcome, George. Thank you, Mark. Field Manual 8-284, Treatment of Biological Warfare Agent Casualties is a tri-service field manual with comprehensive guidelines for diagnosis and therapy at all echelons of care. It will be published by the end of December and will also be available on the Army Surgeon General's website at www.nbc-med.org. George, are we going to get a copy of that uh, with si signature? Who <laughs> All right, how about royalties? You make any royalties? Uh, no royalties. All right, well, Ted, uh, as you highlighted yesterday, you talked about some of the clinical hallmarks for certain diseases. Can you go over those again briefly uh, for, to remind the audience? Okay, I think, I think that would be useful. Uh, remember, we would hope that after familiarizing yourself with the classic presentations of anthrax, plague, smallpox, and botulism, you would readily recognize those diseases in their full-blown form. And again, to review, if you saw a patient with a widened mediastinum on the battlefield, there was no history of trauma, there was no bullet hole through the center of the chest, that's probably anthrax. If you saw bloody sputum in an otherwise healthy young troop, especially if you saw it in multiple otherwise healthy young troops, that ought to make you think plague. A synchronous Pustular, exanthem, ought to make you think smallpox. Again, especially if you have multiple patients with that. And again, flaccid paralysis on the battlefield, again, in multiple patients, ought to make you think botulism. Now, that's all easy to talk about here in the studio. But obviously, amid the fog and confusion of war, things aren't always going to be that easy. Patients aren't always going to present in tight clusters. They may not always present in classic form. As you've seen in our video scenario, they certainly may be mixed in with conventional battle casualties, maybe chemical casualties. And unfortunately, diagnosing these diseases uh, probably won't be as easy as I may have led you to believe yesterday. That's right. Most of the potential biological warfare diseases will present simply as undifferentiated febrile illnesses during the early or prodromal phases before they progress to a characteristic clinical syndrome. Some, such as brucellosis or Q fever, will present as fevers without any localizing features, even when fully developed. In addition, the differential diagnosis of these febrile illnesses will include the naturally occurring endemic diseases such as malaria or typhoid fever, depending on the geographic location. You know, unfortunately, things I think are made even more complex uh, when you consider that there's really multiple portals of entry for each of these biological warfare agents uh, into the body, and that may influence how the disease presents, of course. So disease presentation can vary depending on the route of entry, and we've touched on that somewhat, but again, let me reiterate, uh, bubonic versus pneumonic plague, we talked about that. Uh, bubonic plague can occur naturally, but pneumonic plague sometimes also occurs naturally, but ought to make you think uh, that you're dealing with something sinister, and that's the type of plague that you would expect to see if you contracted it by the aerosol route. I also mentioned SEB food poisoning. Uh, already you get uh, gastroenteritis symptoms, vomiting. If you ingest the toxin, you get pneumonia-like symptoms if you inhale the toxin. So the, the disease manifestations are different depending on how you acquire the agent. Now, with that said though, some diseases will have the same presentation uh, regardless of the route by which you acquire them. And George, I think you realize very well that uh, foodborne botulism probably would look every bit like inhalational botulism. Most of the viral diseases, of course, are going to follow that same paradigm. Some of them, uh, and I like to use VEE as the example, may play out in a little bit different time frame. If you inhale VEE, you get it into your olfactory bulbs immediately, it may get to the brain quicker, you may have a shorter prodrome. But again, I think basically the clinical manifestations would be the same. 
Do right. you agree with that? Exactly. Well, Ted, you're a pediatrician, and Mark's an internist. As clinicians, we are aware that a careful history and physical will lead us towards the diagnosis 90% of the time. Now, we've already discussed all those historical tidbits that might clue us in on the fact that we're dealing with an intentional biological release. Are you aware of a tight cluster of patients with a similar illness? Were only unmasked patients affected? Are you aware of dead animals in the area? What historical bits of information will hone you in to a specific diagnosis? Well, you know, and uh, we even talked about this uh, during, the, during the question and answer. Somebody had a question. What about immunization status? I think, you know, I'd like to know whether everyone in my units had their anthrax shots or other immunizations which are, you know, up to date. Uh, wouldn't that help you in your differential diagnosis? No, I think it would. Uh, in fact, I agree entirely. It's, it's not impossible that someone could be fully vaccinated and still contract anthrax if they were very near ground zero, but uh, certainly I would think that their chances would be dramatically lessened. So it would be useful to know if they were vaccinated. You know, and Ted, as George alluded to, uh, even those diseases that can have an easily recognized classic form might present initially as nonspecific febrile illnesses. Now, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's useful to understand that full-blown anthrax is easy. It's a no-brainer. Uh, if you see a wide mediastinum, especially a cluster of those, there's no bullet holes, that's anthrax. Uh, unfortunately, if you make your diagnosis of anthrax in that manner, it's probably too late to save that patient. Private Snuffy with the widened mediastinum, unfortunately, is the canary. And your job out there is not to save the canary, although, of course, we're going to try to do that. And we want to do that if we can. But your job is really to try to learn rapidly from Private Snuffy and use his case to make the assumption that if he got affected, a lot of other people may have got affected, and if I can get to them quick enough, maybe I can save them. So the full-blown case may be relatively easy, but I think you understand that anthrax in its prodromal form is likely to be very nonspecific, and making the diagnosis there uh, would be virtually impossible without a great deal of clinical suspicion. Right. Smallpox patients can have a nonspecific febrile prodrome for two to four days before the onset of rash. You know, and although pneumonic plague could produce bloody sputum, if we catch a patient early, uh, they may just present as a nonspecific fever. Uh, that patient may also produce, uh, fail to produce very much sputum even in the early stages of the disease. Right. Pneumonic plague could take a day or two to declare itself as pneumonia. Of course, by then, uh, unfortunately, the horse may already be out of the barn. If we wait, you know, over 24 hours to treat someone who's symptomatic with pneumonic plague, uh, you might as well just call the undertaker because by then, uh, their chance of survival is pretty low. You know, it would be nice if we could simply say, I'm going to assume every case of battlefield pneumonia is plague until proven otherwise. But unfortunately, uh, there's several other biological warfare agents that can cause pneumonia as well. Exactly. Tularemia could present like this. Tularemia can be considered a plague-like illness, although milder. The point is, if you're considering a diagnosis of pneumonic plague, consider tularemia in the differential. And in fact, I want to take this opportunity now to talk briefly about tularemia. Again, we didn't have time to talk about tularemia yesterday, but I want to say a few words about it because it is on the Centers for Disease Control's threat list. Now, when they devised this threat list, uh, they went about it with the approach that we can't predict necessarily what every terrorist and nutcase out there uh, might conceivably think makes a weapon. So we're not going to try to do that, but rather we're going to look at what, if used, would give us the greatest consequences or yield the greatest consequences. And uh, anthrax, smallpox, botulism, and plague, I think there were no doubt that those agents belonged on the list. But tularemia also is on that list for uh, several reasons. First of all, it's very, very infectious. So it takes only a few organisms to infect you. And compare that to anthrax, which requires eight to 10,000 spores. So again, let me say a little bit about tularemia now. Well, depending on whether you're a lumper or a splitter, there are several different forms of tularemia. And we speak of the ulcero glandular form, the glandular form, the pneumonic form, the typhoidal form, etc. The ulceroglandular form is the form that occurs most commonly naturally, and it occurs by being, uh, when you are bitten, uh, say by uh, a tick or by a deer fly uh, that has fed on an infected animal, a rabbit, a uh, muskrat, etc. Um, and that's the way that we naturally expect to see tularemia. But there is a pneumonic form and a typhoidal form of tularemia, and those are the forms we would expect to see if it were released as an aerosol. And again, they would cause, or uh, tularemia can cause, pneumonia, which could be, as George said, uh, confused very easily with plague pneumonia. Q fever and meliodosis could also present as pneumonia. Right. In fact, as I recall, Ted, meliodosis can be confused as plague as well. 
Well, you know, certainly Tom Butler thinks so. And uh, in that India outbreak uh, that Dave Dennis talked about earlier, uh, they weren't sure whether some of those cases uh, were plague and uh, wondered, in fact, if some of those cases were melioidosis. So again, you can see the confusion that could be. Right. Both plague and melioidosis are on biological weapons threat lists. Right. Both can cause severe, rapidly progressive pneumonias, and the organisms have similar staining characteristics. Some of the toxins, when inhaled, can produce pneumonitis right. due to inflammation and tissue necrosis. For example, staphylococcal enterotoxin B and ricin. Right. All right. Well, so we've talked about which of the diseases present as nonspecific febrile illnesses as well as pneumonias. Now, George, in our field scenario, patients with hemorrhagic manifestations are seen. Now, those manifestations we've seen included petechiae, purpura, and hemoptysis. Now, yesterday we heard that that could occur with plague. Now, what else could be in the clinical picture? The viral hemorrhagic fevers are characterized by bleeding diathesis. The hemorrhagic fever viruses belong to four families of lipid-enveloped RNA viruses. They could be biological weapons candidates, since some may replicate well enough in cell culture to permit mass production and weaponization. They are infectious by aerosol and cause severe disease with high mortality. Although most will not survive very long while aerosolized, the addition of stabilizers could enhance their weapons potential. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned viral hemorrhagic fevers, George, because that's another agent that we didn't have time to cover yesterday, but again, another one that is on the Centers for Disease Control's threat list. So I want to say a few words about that as well, just like I did with tularemia. Now, USAMRID, Fort Detrick, is famous for its work with Ebola, but uh, in many of our minds, Ebola is really not the best of weapons, and that's because it's not that easy to contract Ebola. Ebola is usually contracted uh, by intimate exposure with blood and body fluids, so you need to be down in the blood and the guts and the gore to have a very good chance of contracting Ebola, at least we thought so. On the other hand, we are aware, or at least Ken Alabeck alleges, that the Soviets weaponized Marburg, a close cousin of Ebola, so apparently are, there are some people out there who do think uh, that these would be viable weapons. Uh, the Aum Shinrikyo, for example, sent teams to Zaire uh, to try to attain, obtain Ebola, so they apparently thought these were good weapons as well. So when the CDC approached this issue, again, looking at it not necessarily uh, from the perspective of what, of what what would be most likely used, but what, if used and if effective, would have had the most devastating consequences. And I think that's one of the reasons these viral hemorrhagic fevers deserve our attention, Mark. You know, and Ted, those diseases pr are pretty bad diseases, but you know, if there is any good news about them, uh, some of them are potentially treatable. Why, why don't you talk about that? Well, that is, that is true. Uh, there is a drug, ribavirin. I think ribavirin is familiar to uh, to pediatricians, certainly. We used aerosolized ribavirin uh, to treat neonates with respiratory syncytial viral uh, pneumonia. And there is the potential to use ribavirin in treating some of these viral hemorrhagic fever uh, cases. Right. Um, ribavirin is active against the arena viruses and some of the bunny viruses and could be available on a compassionate use basis. Unfortunately, it has no activity against the filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg. Okay. So now, so George, we've heard about the viral hemorrhagic fevers and that, you know, they could certainly cause petechiae, purpura, and ecchymosis, uh, you know, basically characteristic of a coagulopathy. Uh, are there other BW diseases that could present with dermatologic manifestations? Ricin intoxication can cause thrombocytopenia and bleeding. Yesterday, we saw dramatic examples of the pustular exanthem of smallpox. Sepsis, due to melioidosis, can also cause a diffuse pustular rash. The mycotoxins can cause cutaneous injury due to local effects. It's important to note that anthrax and tularemia, when delivered as aerosolized biological warfare agents, will not produce the characteristic skin lesions seen in naturally occurring cases, as Ted alluded to. This is because of the respiratory portal of entry. A review of the cutaneous manifestations of BW agents is in the March issue of the Archives of Dermatology. Of course, uh, George is being a little modest here, but uh, he was actually one of the co-authors on that paper. Uh, but I think it's also worth noting that some of the BW diseases are chiefly characterized by their neurologic manifestations. Now, obviously, uh, flaccid paralysis should make us think about botulism, as uh, you know, we've heard a bit about already, Ted. That's right. Uh, botulism uh, on the battlefield would present as a case of flaccid paralysis, and uh, one case of flaccid paralysis uh, might be tough. It might call to mind uh, a fairly broad differential diagnosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, myasthenia gravis, Eaton-Lambert syndrome, etc. I think, though, that multiple cases of the same thing, of flaccid paralysis, really leave little room for doubt. So I don't think uh, that there are too many other neurologic diseases that would be confused with botulism on the battlefield. 
Superficially, maybe, uh, there's one other agent that causes neurologic symptoms, and that, of course, is the chemical agent uh, class, the nerve agent. So the question is, can we differentiate or how can we differentiate nerve agent intoxication from botulism? All right. Well, we're going to have a video about that now because some people do find that's confusing. Before we roll that video, though, I'd like to uh, thank George for being here, and uh, we'll be seeing George a little later on camera. Okay, today we're going to discuss the case of Specialist Kern. Where are you from, Kern? New Jersey, sir. Great. Before we do the actual patient discussion, though, let me set the stage here. The scenario is this. It's 1998, and we're at war with the Soviet Union. The nations of the former Soviet Union have decided they really weren't doing very well on their own. They reformed the new and improved Soviet Union, and now they're not messing around. They're not taking any chances. They've launched a, uh, a full-scale assault over the pole through Canada and have plunged deep into the heartland of the United States. And right now, the front lines of the battle are raging in and around that critical government think tank at Fort Leavenworth. Kansas. You, though, are here with the 28th Cache at Sleepy Fort Bragg, a thousand miles from the front. Nothing going on here at all. Very quiet day at the 28th when in staggers Specialist Curran. And his story goes something like this. Three days ago, he was pulling guard duty. Some kind of alarm went off. He really wasn't sure what this alarm meant, but all his buddies started getting their mop gear. He figured he better get in his mop gear, too but he didn't have his mop gear with him. So he runs back to his tent to try to get his mop gear, trips on the way, hurts his leg, ends up taking him 10 minutes to get in his mop gear. But 30 minutes later, the all clear sounds, gets out of his mop gear, and other than a sore ankle, he feels fine. For the next two days, he goes about his duties, no problem, feels fine. Now on the morning of day three, he staggers into your sleepy aid post here at the 28th cache, and he says, you know, Doc, gotta help me. Having a hard time. Can't catch my breath. Feel real weak. What do you guys think going on with current here? The flu. Flu, good. Where are you from, Pruitt? Georgia. Georgia, good. Flu, absolutely. Influenza, very common disease. It occurs in wartime just as well as in peacetime. And in a scenario like this, especially a scenario a thousand miles from the front line, it's far more likely you're going to be thinking garden variety types of diseases like the flu. Maybe he's got the flu. Maybe he's got mono. Maybe he's just scared that he's going to be sent to the front. Maybe he's worried about his mama back in New Jersey. Maybe he's worried about his girlfriend back in New Jersey. A lot of other things could be going on with Curran, and probably, playing the odds, those things are far more likely than anything real sinister like chemical or biological warfare. Okay, in a chem-bio warfare context, what could this be? Nerve agent? Nerve agent, really good. Good, so this could be nerve agent. At least nerve agent would give you some of the features of Curran's condition here. Now, when you start to approach this on the battlefield, I tend to find that students get real confused. You know, there's a dozen different uh, chemical agents, dozen different biological agents going through their mind, and it gets real difficult trying to sort those out. So what I like to ask students to do is envision this two-by-two -two table. We're looking at, is this a pulmonary syndrome versus a neuromuscular syndrome? And then we're looking at, does this present in delayed fashion, or does this present in immediate fashion? So the first question is, is this a pulmonary syndrome or is it a neuromuscular syndrome? And how would you differentiate those two? Well, you can take a stethoscope here and you could listen to his chest. So if I take a stethoscope here, I'm going to listen to this guy's chest. And if this were primarily a pulmonary syndrome, I might hear Rawls, Ronchi, a lot of congestion in his chest. But I don't hear that here. So this doesn't seem to be primarily a pulmonary syndrome. This seems to be a case of Kern's not able to breathe or he's having trouble breathing, but it's not because there's anything wrong with his lungs. It's because the muscles that operate the lungs don't work properly. And in fact, if I examine other muscles, if I were to lift up his arm, for example, then I would find the same thing. So I'm going to pick his arm up, and you notice it just drops right back down to the gurney. So he seems to have a neuromuscular syndrome rather than a pulmonary syndrome. And you guys are exactly correct when you say that nerve agent intoxication can produce a neuromuscular syndrome. Okay, now how would you differentiate nerve agent intoxication from something else this might be? And again, nerve agent intoxication is a chemical uh, effect. What about biological weapons? Any biological weapon that could cause this? Anybody? 
Botulism? Botulism, Jackson, good. So this could be botulism or it could be nerve agent intoxication. And to the Army truck driver, those two might be confusing, but to a bunch of highly trained medics, there are some very simple ways of differentiating nerve agent intoxication from botulism. And how would you tell the difference between, between those two entities? Secretion. Secretions, good. So what would you expect the nerve agent casualty to look like secretion-wise? Wet. Wet, says. absolutely. So the nerve agent casualty looks a lot like you looked last time you staggered out of the gas chamber. They're drooling, they're slobbering, snots pouring out their nose, tears running out their eyes. What would you expect the bot casualty to look like? Dry. Dry, Dry. absolutely. Yeah. Maynard, good. So the bot casualty, they may have a little bit of drool because their muscles of swallowing are so weak, but in general, you'd expect their tongue and their lips and their gums to be very dry. So secretions, excellent. What else can you use to differentiate? Pupils, good. So the pupils in a nerve agent casualty would be what, constricted or dilated? Constricted. Constricted, constricted. How about a bot victim? Dilated. dilated. So if you looked at Kern's pupils, his pupils would be very dilated. So you can use the presence or absence of secretions, you can use the size of the pupils, and then finally, we talked about the neuromuscular paralysis of nerve agent intoxication and of botulism. And the type of neur neuromuscular paralysis with those two entities is very different. And you notice that when we lifted Curran's arm up, it just flopped right back down to the gurney. So he has a flaccid paralysis. And botulism would give you a very flaccid paralysis. What would the chemical agent, the nerve agent casualty, look like? Well, it could end up being flaccid, but first there's hyperactivity. Right, there's hyperactivity. So the nerve agent casualty generally starts out with a very spastic paralysis. He's twitching, he's spasming, he may even be seizing. So very easy to tell the difference between nerve agent intoxication and botulism based on size of the pupils, based on the type of paralysis, and based on the presence or absence of secretions. But there's an even easier way and a more important way to tell the difference. When would botulism present? You saw he presented three days after this alarm went off, and if you really believe that that alarm was occurred around the time of the exposure, then this took him several days to present. When would a nerve agent casualty present? Immediately. 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 And the, the point I like to make uh, is made by asking you, who decides whether Curran lives or dies out there on the battlefield? Who determines whether he's going to do well or not do well? You guys do. Right, absolutely. You're the medics. If you do the right thing, Curran might pull through. If you don't do the right thing, Curran might not pull through. On the other hand, who decides whether the chemical casualty lives or dies? The, the, the casualty, absolutely. He's out there on the battlefield, he gets exposed to nerve agent. He starts having symptoms immediately. If he gives himself a Mark I, he may pull through. If his buddy gives him a Mark I, he may pull through. But if they don't give him the Mark I out there on the battlefield, chances are he's not going to make it to the 28th cache for you to have a chance at salvaging him. So this guy, did he present immediately or in delayed fashion? He presented in delayed fashion. So it's much more likely what? Chemical or biological? Biological. biological, right. So you've got a delayed casualty with a neuromuscular syndrome. Not much else that can be other than botulism. So you see how with a couple of minutes of training, you guys can readily differentiate pulmonary versus neuromuscular syndrome, immediately, uh, immediate versus delayed presentation. This is a delayed presentation of a neuromuscular syndrome, must be botulism. Not much else that can be out there on the battlefield. So great job. Again, in two minutes worth of training, you guys have shown that you can readily manage these types of patients on the battlefield. The tough part's going to be sorting this guy out from everybody with the flu and mono and malingering and all that kind of stuff. You know, Ted, I, I've always had a lot of difficulty with neurology, and I think that was a great video segment you just did. And I think it showed yesterday in our uh, clinical round segment when neither of us could come up with the uh, diagnosis of botulism in uh, our patient. But, uh, you know, it might be useful for people to separate neurologic findings into two categories, those that are central and those that are peripheral. Uh, botulism is noted for its peripheral manifestations, uh, peripheral neuropathy, as well as its bulbar symptoms. Uh, things like saxitoxin and tr trototoxin might also cause a peripheral neuropathy as part of their clinical picture. You know, and conversely, Venezuelan equine encephalitis certainly would present with central nervous system findings, namely headache and menin meningismus. So I think you're right. Well, yeah, definitely. Uh, and don't forget that some of the plague patients and some of our anthrax patients may also develop uh, meningeal signs and a meningitis uh, as part of their 
part of their disease process. Well, that's a good point. And you know, uh, one of the facts and questions we had concerned the Sverdlovsk anthrax outbreak. And uh, I might add that 21 out of 42, exactly 50% of the Sverdlovsk anthrax victims that went to autopsy uh, actually had a finding of meningitis at autopsies. All right. Well, great, Ted. I think it's, it's good to summarize at this point. Now, we've talked now about patients who present either as nonspecific fevers or patients with pneumonia or with a coagulopathy or with dermatological manifestations uh, with nervous system disease or signs and symptoms. And this certainly makes this, uh, this task of, a, of you know, establishing a diagnosis and formulating a treat treatment plan pretty problematic. You know, hopefully though, Mark, I think we can simplify things and clarify things when we start talking about treatment. But you're absolutely correct to imply that clinical acumen is of the utmost importance. And uh, all the clinical acumen on the world, uh, in the world, on the other hand, though, isn't going to be enough uh, to establish a definitive diagnosis uh, in every case. Well, and that's why it's important uh, to have some competent laboratory backup. While it may be difficult at times to get that backup in CONUS, uh, during peacetime, you know, when we're on the battlefield, as you know, uh, you know, we really need to know ahead of time where we're going to get that support. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we've talked now at length about clinical diagnosis and how it's very important to make that clinical diagnosis. And I always like to use anthrax as my example. Uh, you need to treat anthrax victims before the culture comes back, before the blood culture comes back, before the PCR guys get there uh, to the field, if you want to have a very good chance of salvaging that patient. So often the diagnosis needs to be suspected and made on clinical grounds and treatment needs to be started before a definitive diagnosis is established. But with that said, I'm sure that most people would agree that definitive laboratory diagnosis is critically important in guiding therapy and in establishing a prognosis. So you want to have a concrete, confirmed laboratory diagnosis eventually, and you want to have that pretty early on. That's again going to help our management, it's going to help with prognosis, and it's going to help guide those guys who might have their fingers poised on the button. So in order to help us with confirmatory laboratory diagnosis, it's my pleasure now to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Eric Henschel. And Colonel Henschel uh, is Chief of the Diagnostic Systems Division at uh, USAM up at Fort Detrick. Eric, welcome aboard. Well, thank you for having me back this year. I appreciate it. Okay, well, what kind of laboratory support would be available on the battlefield? Well, I think the laboratory support is going to be fairly limited, uh, but the DOD is taking steps to improve that generally. You know, okay. Colonel Henschel, I can certainly echo that. Uh, you know, when I was in Bosnia, as I recall, the combat support hospital there, you know, they had some special screening measures for things like hantavirus, but some of their other laboratory support, especially, you know, the microbiology and, uh, and culture capability was definitely pretty limited. Yeah, I think your experience is, is pretty typical, especially for the, in, the endemic infectious diseases, where laboratory services have generally been de-emphasized in many cases. But I think you'll find that in theaters of operations where exposure to BW agents is a really a high risk, uh, microbiological services will be augmenting in the theater. This was true in Operation Desert Storm and continues even today through current operations. I think you'll find that there's been a heightened awareness for BW in the Department of Defense. And if you, if you as a medical care provider, screamed anthrax, it'd be a little bit like <laughs> saying fire in a movie theater, you know? Right, I think right. you'll find that there'll be a lot of responders. Okay, so let's say I think I've got a biological casualty on my hands. Yeah. Presumably, uh, I'm gonna have to use my clinical judgment and I'm gonna have to start therapy. But eventually, uh, again, I want confirmation. So what do I do with my diagnostic specimens if, for, for example, I'm down at Echelon 2 or at Echelon 3? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, specimens are gonna be forwarded through the normal technical channels that are available. Uh, in a theater of operation that's fairly mature, you, you might find a theater army medical laboratory. The other support that may be available to, to your Navy EPMUs that are stationed throughout the, uh, out the world, and, and in the future we're hoping for a deployable U.S. Air Fo Force uh, asset that uh, will be supporting the theater as well. Um, if these deployable assets aren't available, those specimens are, are going to have to come back to the CONUS reference laboratories, either to USAMRT or to the Navy Medical Research Center in Bethesda. Okay. But the CDC could also play a role here. 
Well, Colonel Henschel, you know, one of the problems I've, I've noted, you know, for those of us down in the trenches, you know, sometimes, you know, lavish felts invariably seem to take forever. And, you know, it seems by, like by the time we get them out in the field, certainly, uh, it may be too late to make decisions. And, you know, when we do get them on time, uh, very quickly, in other words, uh, you know, invariably they're negative. Uh, and now I don't know if that's because the bugs die in transit or, or what happens, but, you know, what can we as clinicians do then to uh, improve the speed and accuracy of these tests? Well, the critical elements for success here is really in the collection, collecting the right sample, in, in the handling, making sure that the sample is preserved, and transporting it rapidly to a, to a laboratory that really can uh, perform the tests that are necessary. The quality of, a, of the laboratory test depends critically upon how that specimen has been handled before it reaches the laboratory. Very often I've seen in operations where the specimen just is, is worthless because it's, they've waited too long or it's taken too long to get to the laboratory. Uh, but the other critical component is the physician or healthcare provider must coordinate closely with the laboratory. The laboratories sometimes get specimens and, and don't have any idea about why that specimen arrived. And so it's important to Talk to them, call them up, tell them what you have. And also, your observations are important for us deciding on what test plan we should use for how we handle that specimen. All of these things can improve the service that we give the healthcare providers. You know, I think our audience members might be wondering what kind of clinical samples you need uh, to be sent to the lab after a suspected incident. And uh, to answer that, before I go to you, Eric, maybe it would be useful to turn to uh, Major Neil Woolen uh, on videotape and to ask him for his opinions on this. So, Neil? For early agent identification uh, from a medical standpoint, one would need to primarily focus on the portals of entry and also body parts that may be exposed to, to the air, to the environment. Um, the ears, uh, nasal cavity, uh, oral cavity to include uh, sputum uh, would be good indicators of whether or not uh, the person has been exposed. Uh, conjunctival swabs, any hairy part of the body, mustaches, uh, um, eyebrows uh, could be uh, swabbed or even clipped and uh, collected as samples. Uh, one of the, the important factors here is to use a type of swab that the agent can be easily uh, removed from once it's in the laboratory to do the analysis on because you're not going to carry the swab all the way through so we would need to remove the uh, organism from the swab and rayon swabs work, work best for that. Okay, well, Eric, do you have any additional comments on clinical specimens? Sure, well, you know, compre comprehensive information about each of the critical or priority agents is contained in the Book of Eitzen, as you call okay. it, or the Blue Book. Okay. I, I think also that, that information is summarized in the student manual, right. if I'm not correct. Yes, um, shown, shown in this, uh, in the, in the uh, shown here is also probably is a summary of, of the kinds of specimens that, that I particularly like. I usually think of the three different kinds of patient scenarios. One is that immediate post-exposure period. That's when maybe the BIDS unit or the portal shield unit has gone off and people are healthy. What, is the, what are you supposed to do? Uh, there may actually be patients showing up at your emergency center from, from uh, mm -hmm. psychological trauma, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else. But in, the, uh, in that immediate post-exposure period, we found in laboratory animal studies that we can recover uh, anthrax, at least, from, from the nose uh, or from the face or hairy portions of the face within about a 24-hour period. Uh, in, that first, in that very first early period, it's also important to take a serum specimen that we can archive and then use as a reference for later if that patient becomes ill. Once you have a patient that is acutely ill, maybe is having those, I don't know, we used to call them flu-like symptoms, mm -hmm. um, then you begin to take what are the specimens that would ordinarily be clinically indicated. Um, I still would take swab samples of the nose and the throat. We found some, some of the viruses begin their replication in the throat, and we found that we can, we can isolate Venezuelan equine encephalitis, for example, from the throat. Uh, interestingly, um, the detection of anthrax falls very quickly uh, from, from the nose. You can't, you can't detect it after 24 hours very easily. You can detect it in feces, though, yeah. by animal studies, and so that might be another specimen that we would want, especially for anthrax. Of course, I would expect the health care provider also to think about the sputum in the case of plague. Uh, urine has been a source for some of the toxins, especially in that acutely ill patient. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in the critically ill patient, of course, then it really becomes ob more obvious that there's that that you have a, probably a patient with a, a known syndrome, and there you're going to rely also on blood, urine. Uh, feces and s what other other specimens that might be clinically indicated. Okay, so let's say I get you your clinical specimens. Now, what kind of laboratory tests do you use uh, back at your reference lab to identify these agents? Yeah. You might remember from Neil Woolen's discussion talking about actually three levels of identification. Mm -hmm. We have a presumptive ID and we have a confirmatory ID and we have a really the definitive identification. In order to reach these different levels, of identification, we use an integrated system of diagnostics at USAMRIN. What we find is that no single technology is really sufficient to make a definitive identification. Mm -hmm. And so we use these overlapping technologies. Some of these are based on immu immunodiagnostics, such as immunofluorescence assay or the enzyme-linked immunoassay. Other assays are based upon gene amplification, such as PCR. Uh, finally, at, at a reference center like USAMRID, we would use culture. And it's the combination of these things that gives us the highest level of sensitivity and specificity in our assays. At USAMRID, we actually demand that we be able to identify at least two or more independently derived biological markers in order to make identification. Now, you should be able to do some initial risk assessment based on one of those markers. But if you were going to try and make strategic or tactical decisions on any of those tests, you might want to wait for the definitive identification. You know, Eric, uh, you, you've probably heard of these. In fact, I'm sure you get a lot of calls about these, but uh, I do as well, these smart tickets. We get a lot of questions uh, about them. Uh, some lieutenant down at the Quartermaster yeah. Bakery uh, will have gone out and got a smart ticket at the hardware store or wherever and went around testing, and he got anthrax from the heating ducts. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the utility of those. Yeah, the, the, calling them smart tickets is probably a misnomer, but there are, there are commercial assays available for identifying biological warfare agents, and I can't recommend any of them. Hmm. Uh, none of them have been validated for medical use, and that's the important consideration. Hmm. Now, there, there are other similar assays. You maybe heard from Don Bewley about the handheld assay, the immunodichromatographic right. assay. That particular assay was optimized for use with the portal shield and bids units. And so it was optimized for a very particular situation. And what we find is that when people use these assays off protocol, they, get, they become it's, somewhat nonspecific. Mm -hmm. The other problem with these assays is they have a tendency to be not be very sensitive. Uh, they generally do not detect biological agents at a concentration that would be the equivalent to the infectious dose for man. And so there's a possibility of false negatives. So the problem is what kind of decision can you make based on that test? In fact, in the circumstances where I've seen it used, it's more likely that it, it has delayed getting that specimen to a qualified laboratory, and that should really be the key. That's where the emphasis should be, to get that really in the hands of the subject matter experts as soon as possible to make the identification. Well, sir, I think that brings up a good point. And, and uh, let me ask you then, if we're out in the field and, and our forward lab then has, has some kind of a presumptive ID on a BW agent, uh, do we need to do any further confirmation beyond that level? Oh, absolutely. And uh, that should be a message that you should have gotten from Neil Woolen in, in, in the tape segments. Uh, he, the, uh, the medical decisions are only going to be based upon the confirmed identification, I think. Okay, so how fast can a biological warfare specimen or sample be confirmed, and how fast can those results be uh, made available to the requesting facility? You know, that's a difficult question because the time that it takes to process a sample and get the right answer depends a little bit upon, you know, what the workload is. If you have a thousand patients sending specimens to the laboratory, that's a lot different than if you have the one or two. I think you probably mm -hmm. do recognize that. that. And each of the agents we find have particular, they, they each pose special technical problems. The other thing is that it also depends upon the biological matrix that you're sending the sample in, for example, if it's blood or feces, okay? Uh, but all that being considered, USAMRIN has had some experience in being able to judge what, how long it takes to make a definitive identification. And generally, I can say that for anthrax and for many agents, we can get, have, a, have a definitive identification in about 20 hours. We can have a confirmed result in about 12 hours. And certainly, we can do an initial risk assessment meaning telling you whether we really, you really think, we really think you have a biological agent in mm -hmm. about an hour to two hours. 
And so that, those should give you general guidelines for how long it takes. Well, that's certainly a lot better than I would have thought. Yeah. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's say we have a positive sample then from a, a BW patient. Is there someone we're, you know, we're supposed to report that to or something like that? Well, that's a good question. And really, um, the reporting chain for any uh, infectious diseases is, is, is really defined. You mm -hmm. really need to contact the command surgeon, and, and especially if you think it's a biological warfare agent. Um, so we use, the, we use the medical chain. Now, I've, I've had questions about whether, from medical caregivers, whether they should be thinking about NBC reporting and all mm -hmm. those things, mm -hmm. you know. And actually, I, I have a feeling of that, that that isn't really something I want medical caregivers to be concerned about. I really think that the, real, the identification of biological warfare agents in a the theater really requires kind of a, a, an integration of information and really you'll find that the command surgeon will attempt to integrate that maybe with some report of a missile or attack or other things that were going on at the same time. And you as a medical caregiver as a, as in that frontline uh, field hospital isn't going to be able to, to see these other things that are going on at the same time. So use the medical chain. That's really really the criti critical element there. Okay. Well, Colonel Henschel, I would presume that, you know, if we had a large scale, either biological or chemical attack, you know, we're going to have uh, some dead bodies, uh, oh, yeah. you know, around. In fact, we've seen, uh, you know, in our scenario here today, the, uh, some people dying. Uh, you know, what kind of information could be useful from those, uh, you know, the dead bodies? The, the f curious, it's not always what comes from the body that's important or from the, from, the, from the patient. It's often the information that you have that's important. So if, they, if you have, uh, I notice a lot of health care givers also keep their little notebooks and, and things like that. All of that information is very critical as a follow-up to the a mortality where a BW agent is suspected. The pathologist will... Um, be wanting to take tissues, and some of the important tissues are postmortem blood, for example, if available. Blood is an important source of, of agent very often. All the bacterial agents, for example, cause bacteremia mm -hmm. eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, lung and spleen are obvious samples as well. The uh, mediastinal lymph nodes could be a source of organism, for example. Liver and other organs. But I think that we don't have to think of these as this particular situation is different from any other autopsy. Again, it depends upon whatever is clinically indicated are the mm -hmm. kind of specimens that you're going to want to take. Okay. Okay, well, thanks uh, very much, Eric, uh, for being here today. Now, right now, I want to take a moment uh, to talk to our Air Force and Navy colleagues in the audience. We've heard uh, a lot about what laboratory support the Army provides. So, Captain Hansen, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what the Navy has uh, as far as clinical specimens and as far as diagnostics to back up these detection systems. Uh, sure. Uh those Navy preventive medicine units that I mentioned, the four that the Navy has throughout the world, those are deployable units and, and built into their capability is a forward deployable lab capability. Now this has been used with some success uh, in different operations. It is a, essentially a public health lab that, that helps us with diagnostics on things like malaria, diarrhea, hepatitis, but also built into this forward deployable lab our BW capabilities, BW identification capabilities. These Navy forward deployed lab uh, elements work closely with their colleagues in the Research and Development Command who actually develop the rapid diagnostics and so they try to remain at the essentially the cutting edge of the validated tools. They're, these are small and light units that can be put forward and, and operate in or, or associated with a clinical facility to, to help diagnose uh, patients as quickly as possible. Okay, well thanks. Uh, Colonel Bradshaw, I don't, I don't know if the Air Force does anything differently or if you want to comment on what the Air Force has well, just, available. Just a couple of comments. Uh, of course, unlike the uh, Army and, and the Marines, for instance, who have a fairly large footprint on the ground, the Air Force tends to have a little bit smaller footprint. Uh, and our hospital is an air transportable hospital, which means we don't take a whole lot along with it. So usually our, our basic laboratory capabilities in an air transportable hospital are fairly limited. Uh, in that sense, for more advanced things, we might rely on the TAML, for instance, or the forward deployed uh, uh, laboratories for the Navy for more advanced capabilities. We do, all, all, however, have a biological augmentation team. Uh, and part of that is we're developing a, a capability called RAPIDS. We, we have our own acronyms also in the Air Force. So we have the same affliction as everybody else. Uh, but uh, that stands for a Rapid Automated uh, Pathogen Identification Device System. Uh, and it's basically similar to what Major Woolen was talking about earlier. It's a PCR-based portable system uh, that, that can be used in theater, 
to uh, fairly rapidly, say within 150 minutes from setup to diagnosis, uh, do clinical diagnostic uh, specimens with, a, again, a presumptive diagnosis with definitive uh, confirmatory diagnosis later at USAMRID. But it would allow us to get a much more rapid idea of what's going on uh, in theater for clinical specimens. Okay. Well, thanks very much. All right. I think it's now uh, time for a well-deserved break. Uh, it uh, should be lunchtime on the Pacific Coast. It's probably well past lunchtime uh, in the central time zone and mountain time zone. So uh, at least let us give you a 10-minute break. Now you can at least grab a cup of coffee, maybe a bite to eat, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your break. I think we understand now how to recognize and investigate a biological weapon outbreak. We've also discussed the different clinical presentations of some of the potential BW agents and how the lab and detectors in the field can help you make a diagnosis. Now let's move on and start to talk treatment. Okay, but first, let's review some of the key concepts. Now, we mentioned most of those key concepts in our Ten Commandments discussion. I think, though, that you have to remember chemical casualty management is quite different than biological casualty management, and that's because biological agents have incubation periods. So I think it's useful to think of the average chemical incident as a hazmat incident, whereas I think it's useful to think of the average biological agent uh, incident as a public health crisis. The CDC is going to discuss this uh, in more detail tomorrow. But what this, in essence, means is that chemical casualties present immediately. Biological casualties often present in delayed fashion. And as you saw in my little video where I had the different makeup on, this makes first aid, self-aid, and buddy aid much less important in the case of biological casualty management than it would be in the case of chemical casualty management. Right, uh, Ted. With that in mind, then, let's look at treatment beyond the care an individual soldier might be able to provide uh, his buddy or for himself. Let's move, then, beyond Echelon 1A. Now, for that, we've uh, asked our colleague, George uh, Christopher, back, and he's brought his doctrine with him again. George, welcome back. Thanks, Mark. Now, to reemphasize, the first thing to remember about treatment is to pay attention to the basics of supportive care. Um, initial care might include oxygen, intravenous fluid, and other basic measures of supportive care. So we shouldn't approach these patients any differently than That's any right. other? That's right, just like you would any other patient. Okay, so don't forget your ABCs that you learned back in BLS. Exactly. Okay, George, I think both you and I agree that uh, specific antibiotic therapy uh, is a no-brainer if you know the agent and its susceptibilities. Right. Rational antibiotic therapy involves using a drug that's active against the specific agent and ideally has a narrow spectrum, low toxicity, and low cost. Now that uh, may be different than what we've, uh, you know, some of the drug reps might be peddling these days, uh, you know, to use the biggest gun agent available that's got the best spectrum. Right. Gorillacillin and cefakilum all have their place, but in pediatrics, if we have a bug that's sensitive to Kool-Aid, then Kool-Aid's the drug of choice. Now, that's not always uh, so easy to institute on the battlefield. First of all, the patient uh, on the battlefield presenting, and this is true in uh, civilian conventional medicine as well, they don't always present with a label tattooed to their forehead telling you uh, what they have, what bug they're infected with, what its sensitivities are. So uh, because of that, because we're going to see casualties before we know what's going on, I think it's helpful to talk about syndromic-based therapy. Right. So in a biological warfare scenario, it might be appropriate to cover multiple agents initially before we have a specific etiologic diagnosis. Right. Great. Well, you know, we have to remember that on the battlefield, multiple agents could be used at the same time. Uh, you know, there may be some rationale for the notion that if you find one agent, there might be more. It might make sense then, uh, you know, to use a broad spectrum treatment until we can establish a definitive diagnosis and rule out multiple agents. Okay, one of the bits of good news about biological warfare, though, is that many of the bacterial diseases that we talk about in a BW context are susceptible to some very common antibiotics. For example, doxycycline can be used to treat anthrax, it can be used to treat plague, and it can be used to treat tularemia, brucellosis, and Q fever as well. Now, that's great. Well, uh, George, let's say then, you know, based on your epidemiology, that you think you've got a BW attack going on, uh, you know, but you don't yet have a diagnosis. What would you recommend for empiric therapy? Well, Mark, that's going to depend on the situation, but you can go a long way to arriving at a good decision based on the clinical syndromes that we discussed earlier. For example, if patients start coming in with flaccid paralysis, they might have botulism, but not anthrax, plague, or other diseases for which antibacterial drugs would be indicated. 
Okay, so let's talk first about the patient presenting with pneumonia. Uh, you've got a tight cluster of cases of pneumonia based on the evidence you think it might be deliberate, you think it might be a biological attack, uh, maybe you do a sputum gram stain, that gram stain's negative or it's equivocal or you don't have gram staining uh, materials available at the moment, uh, what do you do then? Right, well the differential diagnosis of pneumonia in a biological warfare scenario is going to include plague, meliodosis, tularemia, brucellosis, Q fever, as well as some of the toxins. Now in that case, I'd consider a combination of ciprofloxacin plus an aminoglycoside, either streptomycin or genomycin. This combination is going to give first-line bactericidal therapy against the treatable but potentially lethal agents of plague and tularemia. Now based on in vitro susceptibility, it will at least buy some time against meliodosis, brucellosis, and Q fever. Hmm. Um, ciprofloxacin plus doxycycline would give a similar spectrum of activity and would be a rational alternative. Okay. Yeah, and one of the other things is that, uh, that drug uh, combination would also be useful against anthrax. Now anthrax, uh, keep in mind of course, as we mentioned yesterday, does not cause your garden variety pneumonia. It actually uh, doesn't cause pneumonia per se at all, it causes a mediastinitis. But those patients may present with respiratory symptoms. Therefore, they could potentially be confused with pneumonia, especially if, you know, as sometimes happens, you don't have an x-ray machine handy or it's not working. Uh, so what about the patient then uh, who comes in just with a nonspecific febrile illness? Well, the differential diagnosis would be even broader. It would include anthrax, the viral agents, as well as some of the endemic, naturally occurring diseases. But if you think you're in a biological warfare scenario, you've got to cover the treatable diseases namely the bacterial diseases that lend themselves to antibiotic therapy. The combinations of ciprofloxacin plus an aminoglycoside or ciprofloxacin plus uh, doxycycline would still make sense. Well, I agree. And then, you know, something like uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, uh, also called VEE, you know, can cause a nonspecific fever and antibiotics wouldn't help. Uh, However, you know, if you've given a patient a short course of antibiotics and later you make that diagnosis of VEE, you know, those antibiotics aren't going to hurt that patient anyway. Now, Mark, I, I know you don't want everyone out there in television land uh, to go around thinking they should treat everything with antibiotics. And I also know uh, that uh, they are going to have uh, a copy of their blue book in their pocket. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and, and I think I want to make use of this blue book, you're not going to remember which diseases need which antibiotics when you're out there. Uh, you're not going to remember all the specifics of antibiotic therapy. And again, that's why you have this blue book. BDUs have two hip pockets for a reason. One was designed for your blue book. One was designed for the chemical people's green book. And uh, Colonel Madsen, uh, who was in the audience yesterday, uh, has put these into many of your hands. Now, uh, as I asked in my scenario, who decides whether the biocasualty lives or dies? Well, it's you. It's you, the medic out there. If you do the right thing in short order, maybe the casualty lives. If you don't do the right thing, maybe the casualty dies. Now, who decides whether the chemical casualty lives or dies? Well, as you heard in our scenario, it's the casualty. If he doesn't give himself his Mark I antidote in short order, he never even makes it to medical care. So. What I would recommend, and unfortunately Colonel Madsen's not here to, to hear this, but uh, what I would recommend is get rid of this, steal, <laughs> steal your buddy's copy of his blue book, and uh, put two blue books in your pocket next time you go to war. Great, Ted. Well, since everybody's going to be forever, forever more carrying two copies of that blue book around for reference, you know, I don't think we need to go into sp the specifics uh, of therapy for specific diseases in great depth. You know, I agree, Mark. We uh, covered that at least for five agents yesterday, but the bottom line is uh, once you have a definitive diagnosis, this is a no-brainer. Choosing proper therapy is a matter of looking it up. Uh, but that's not to say you're going to save everyone. Uh, you're still going to have casualties, but you're going to do the right thing uh, if you make a diagnosis in short order. Remember, ultimately, your therapy is going to be guided by sensitivity data as well. Well, Ted, uh, you know, I'd like to play devil's advocate, advocate here. Uh, let's say someone loses that blue book, or let's say they've forgotten it, or, you know, they've ordered uh, George's FM-8-284, and that hasn't arrived yet, lo and behold. And, uh, George, you know, uh, what other resources are out there for the audience? Well, the World Wide Web is an excellent resource. We've already mentioned the Army Surgeon General's website, and there are certainly others out there. Uh, the course packets include a list of very useful references. Great. Okay, well, let's uh, take this concept of empiric treatment, treatment one step further, Ted. Uh, let's say I'm a special forces medic, and I'm working under covert conditions. I've only got a couple men with me, and I've got no doc, and I, I definitely have no lab with me. Uh, we get slimed by a bio attack, and all I've got is my aid bag. What can I do for my guys? 
Well, Mark, I think even in the most austere of circumstances, with no diagnostic aids available other than your keen sense of clinical acumen, uh, you can still make some very intelligent decisions. And uh, to help uh, those grunts down there at Echelon 1, I think it's useful to construct a matrix in your mind. And I like to think of this two-by-two two matrix, where I divide casualties into those that present in immediate fashion and those that present in delayed fashion. And then furthermore, I divide them into those that present with prim primarily pulmonary symptomatology and those that present primarily with neuromuscular symptomatology. Now, I think it's useful to go ahead and start filling in that matrix. And when you start to fill it in, there are a lot of potential agents we talk about in this bio course. Uh, the chemical people talk about a lot of agents, but for many of those agents, there's no specific therapy available, nor is there any specific therapy required. For many of the casualties we're talking about, supportive care is the answer. So let's throw out for a minute those diseases that require only supportive care. What you're left with then uh, are actually very few diseases indeed. And you can see them here in the matrix. The only thing that immediately causes neurologic casualties is nerve agent intoxication, uh, botulism is in a category by itself, cyanide, and then finally several of these infectious diseases. Now, you're probably not going to have bot antitoxin down at Echelon 1. You may not have a cyanide kit, but you're going to have nerve agent uh, antidote, and hopefully you're going to have antibiotics. And the beauty is, as I discussed earlier, doxycycline actually covers all of these infections pretty well. Now, as an infectious disease doc, never would I want to give you the impression that you don't need to think about the patient. You don't need to make a definitive diagnosis. You can just give everybody doxycycline. But on the other hand, at Echelon 1, before you know what's going on, if you think of these four categories, I think you can easily see not much fits into each of those separate categories and each of them has its own specific therapy. Right. We need to remember again that many patients, including those in the prodromal or early phases of anthrax and plague, will present simply with an undifferentiated febrile illness. For that reason, I recommend that patients with fever in a biological warfare scenario be treated just like those with pneumonia, namely with broad empiric therapy. Now, Ted, you talked about this algorithm, uh, this two-by-two two matrix. Is that available to the Echelon 1 medic right now? Well, Mark, uh, it's available through this course, obviously. We've written some recommendations uh, along these lines. Uh, hopefully, they'll be published in military medicine soon. You know, I wonder if that might have been the rejection letter I saw in your mailbox the other day. Uh, it undoubtedly was, knowing my career. I want to remind you, though, for the, for the last time, those of you out in the studio audience, there's certainly no substitute for good laboratory backup and for a thorough, well-planned medical workup. And I caution you, this algorithmic approach is not a license to stop thinking about the patient. That's key. As soon as the patients who are being treated empirically uh, can be reevaluated, they should be um, evaluated by more experienced medical personnel, appropriate laboratory studies should be done, and then the therapy modified accordingly. You know, uh, you know, there's one thing here that bothers me about all this question, you know, discussion of therapy, and that's availability. You know, when I was in Bosnia, I can't imagine that my buddy Bruno, who was in the pharmacy there, had that much Cipro on hand. You know, I understand, Mark. Uh, last time I was deployed, I think we had enough doxycycline to treat the mess sergeant's uh, chlamydia infection. But uh, <clears throat> we're, we're trying to do something about that problem. And uh, as I said earlier, DOD feels your pain. Uh, in the Army, when we go to war, we speak of sets, kits, and outfits. Those are the component modules uh, that we take all of our equipment to war with. Uh, and those sets, kits, and outfits have some doxycycline and ciprofloxacin in them, but certainly the amount is limited. There are specific chemical warfare set kits and outfits, uh, but there are no bio uh, sets kits and outfits as yet. However, the Joint Readiness Clinical Advisory Board uh, is meeting. They've developed task time treater files, uh, looking at recommended ways to treat these various diseases. Those task time treater files will drive the, log the logistics train, and ultimately, uh, these drugs will be incorporated in our go-to-war sets, kits, and outfits. I think you know the wheels turn slowly. It'll be a few years uh, before they're filtered down everywhere. But again, we're aware of the problem, and hopefully it will be fixed long before you ever need it. Great, Ted. Thanks. Um, all right, now at this point, I think we've pretty much beaten diagnosis and treatment to a pulp. So let's go back to the field and see if our buddies at the 405th Cache have, uh, have come up with a diagnosis yet. Tempo 2, it's stop breathing. I need help. Cold blue, cold blue. Cold bed 2, cold bed 2. I'll take it, I'll take it. All right, let's hook up the monitor and charge up the defibrillator. Okay, this patient still has a heartbeat, but he stopped breathing. Bag him, let's bag him. Okay, he's going to need intubation. 
Let's get him tubed here. Okay, I'll tube him. Okay, let's get him tubed. Good. Okay. Pick up bye. that bag. Give me a couple good breaths here. Okay, we're in. We're in. All right, hook him up to the uh, ventilator. Okay, I'll I'll take over from now. Take great, this. great. Damn. What's going on here? Patients are dropping like flies. We don't have the slightest idea what's going on. And the labs went in when we, as soon as possible after the okay. Great. Okay, Borgard, Borgard, Borgard. Okay. He's got a 36,000 white count with a left shift. He's got gram-negative rods in his sputum. Dr. Cooper, this young soldier has gram-negative rods in his sputum. I mean, what do we got going on here? Klebsiella, E. coli, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know, but if this is a BW agent, then that narrows the differential diagnosis quite a bit. Let me take a look at that uh, stain. Damn it, these organisms are bipolar staining. You could have pneumonic plague here. Did you say plague, sir? Plague. It's okay, we can treat, what do you treat that with? Streptomycin? Streptomycin or genomycin would be a suitable alternative. For the staff, we need everybody masked up here. Uh, and doxycycline prophylaxis for everyone who's had face-to-face -face contact. And we need to initiate a case contact investigation with all unit members. Great, I need a contact division surgeon right away. They need to know that we've got a pneumonic plague outbreak here. We need to check with the pharmacist. Right now, we gotta get these antibiotics started. Let's move out. Okay. Okay, so it looks like the assumption in our scenario is that we're dealing with a plague outbreak, but based on the information you have, is there anything else this could be? Anything else this could be? Tularemia? Tularemia, right. Remember, we mentioned tularemia was a plague-like illness, gram-negative rod. On the sputum, it can look every bit like a uh, plague. Anything else? Melioidosis. Melioidosis. Uh, again, another gram-negative rod disease causes pneumonia, talked about in a biological warfare context. This could be viral, could be influenza, and the gram-negative rods could be a red herring. Well, let's review a little bit. We've talked about uh, ways to protect against plague. We can divide uh, those ways into uh, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. When we talk about prophylaxis, we can talk about immunoprophylaxis versus chemoprophylaxis. So again, you have this two-by-two two matrix, this pre-exposure immunoprophylaxis, post-exposure immunoprophylaxis, pre-exposure chemo, and post-exposure chemoprophylaxis. Um, <clears throat> but beyond prophylaxis, beyond the uh, antibiotics and beyond the immunizations, I think it's also useful to talk about physical means of protection. Now, plague, remember, is one of the few biological agents uh, that is actually contagious person to person. And I think there's the perception out there amongst many laymen and even amongst many me medical people uh, that the words infectious and contagious are synonymous. In fact, they're not. Uh, most of the diseases we talk about in a biological warfare context are infectious, but, uh, but only two of them are contagious. Again, plague uh, and, and smallpox. Uh, so here's one of the two, perhaps, uh, that is contagious. And now we want to know about physical physical protection of these agents, Mark? Yeah, Ted, and, and basically, you've brought up a good point here. There are, there are only those two agents that are contagious from person to person. Uh, one of the benefits, at least, is that we do have prophylactic measures for plague, and, uh, and that's doxycycline. And then uh, we can vaccinate people early for smallpox, of course, if we have enough vaccine, as was discussed yesterday. I think, Mark, we already discussed yesterday also that plague's a worse weapon for the battlefield commander in some respects because of its contagiousness. Right, and prophylactic treatments are available for many of the agents that are not spread person to person. For example, anthrax and tularemia. Mm. You know, prophylactic treatments for these diseases uh, that we're talking about are listed uh, in your student manuals. Now, remember, you can't get the diseases that George has mentioned from your patients. Uh, if you're at ground zero um, and uh, an anthrax weapon goes off, uh, then you uh, perhaps are in trouble if you didn't have your mask on and perhaps you need prophylaxis. In fact, definitely you need prophylaxis. On the other hand, if you're a medical care provider, you're taking care of anthrax patients, you're not at risk of contracting anthrax from your patients. You know, uh, Ted, don't forget that uh, when it comes to prophylaxis, you're going to need to find out who actually needs it. Now, in a full-scale war, uh, that's going to be tough. And we talked about this, of course, earlier in the epi, epi segment, but hopefully you can use your epidemiology to know who to prophylax while they're still in their incubation phase. Now, this will likely be uh, people like other unit members, co-workers, you know, people who are basically in the same area. 
Now, there's a reason the symbol for an epidemiologist is a shoe with a hole worn through it. Uh, those PM people will be out there wearing uh, through their shoes uh, you know, while they're hunting down these people. Okay, well, George, I'd like to thank you uh, once again for being here uh, today. Uh, now, as our scenario uh, at the 405th has unfolded, uh, it looks like they're dealing with an outbreak of plague. And we need to talk about protecting the medical staff uh, with infection control measures. Again, we've already talked about chemoprophylaxis and immunoprophylaxis, but as medical care providers, we have to be aware that our patients might bring contagious diseases into our facilities, and those contagious diseases, like smallpox and pneumonic plague, could infect other patients and, God forbid, the medical staff. We can't do much for our patients if we're all ill as well. Now, we've already discussed the medical prophylaxis. With me to discuss protection uh, is Major Don Nurges. You may recognize him uh, from our audience yesterday. He's going to help uh, discuss the importance of infection control. John is a uh, research protocol nurse at USAMR. He's also uh, the officer in charge of the aeromedical isolation team, as well as head nurse uh, in our BL4 care facility. Uh, welcome, John. Now, John, it's... Uh, it's obvious that I want to avoid passing out prophylactic drugs to everyone on the medical staff every time a patient with plague comes in, if I can do that. So is there anything I can do to avoid doing that? Sure. Uh, first thing, don't panic. But don't take it too lightly either. Something else, uh, make sure that your both pockets are right. filled with that book. Got that covered. Um, you know, nurses, doctors, medics, we, we like to feel that we have control over all the situations in the hospital. And uh, in this case, the BW scenario, we do. You know, as team leader of the air medical isolation team, um, I have to ensure that we train for the worst case scenarios, the most out of control scenarios. Well, George, uh, John, what is the AIT? Can you tell the audience? Sure. The, the air medical isolation team is capable of transporting patients uh, with really highly infectious diseases, um, you know, plague, smallpox, and even worse, diseases that we don't know what they are. Um, Really, it was designed for the scientists in the field who might catch our experiment. So, you know, we train for those worst case scenarios, and in many ways, training that way is easier. Mm -hmm. If you know you have a highly contagious disease, you can treat the patient accordingly. You know, it's like the difference between, you know, standard precautions, we all know what that is, and then contact precautions. If you know there's an infectious process that could take you or your crew out, you'll take additional precautions. You know, we have these negatively pressured, uh, HEPA filtered, high speed, low drag stretchers. But the AIT also trains with standard and contact precautions because they work. You know, good techniques like gowns, masks, gloves are usually enough to handle most infectious diseases. You know, because of where I work, I'm at USAMRID, and I'm in the know. You know, BW events scare me more than a lot of people because I know a lot. Uh, but I also know that there's a lot you can do to protect yourself and still give excellent patient care. So I guess, you know, take home message is understand that handling BW warfare patients is no different than handling any other infectious disease patients. We have excellent old school established infection control procedures which really work well. They've worked for a long time. You know, I call them the BW ABCs. All right, uh, John, why don't you tell us about what some of those ABCs are? Well, um, Standard precautions are required for all BW agent casualties, and for most agents, that's fine. That means you use a gown, gloves, face mask, eye protection, if you're going to any procedure which might splash uh, blood or body fluid. And this applies whether you're in the field, fixed medical facility, and it applies for all your patients, not just BW casualties, but any infectious disease patient, and once again, any uh, patient with an unknown infection, you know, those fevers of unknown origin. Well, I'm sure you know, beyond standard precautions, there are transmission-based precautions. And for those of you out there in the audience, uh, uh, there are airborne droplet and contact precautions. And airborne precautions in general are the precautions we'd use for smallpox, droplet precautions for pneumonic plague. Right. You know, and some diseases uh, that present primarily with cutaneous manifestations can be handled with the contact precautions that uh, Ted just mentioned. The, uh, the BW disease that come to mind are uh, cutaneous anthrax and bubonic plague. I realize, though, that uh, you don't typically think of a BW scenario causing those types of illness presentations, uh, unless in the case of plague, for example, our adversary were to try to spread the disease with infected fleas. Okay, well, John, 
Let's say we're dealing with one of the contagious biological warfare diseases, smallpox or pneumonic plague. How would you propose to isolate casualties from one of those diseases? Well, smallpox, ideally, um, you want your patients, you know, in a negative pressure isolation because it requires airborne precautions and it's so contagious. When, in, when you're in the room, you want to wear a HEPA filter respirator, and ideally, you and your staff have been vaccinated before you're allowed to care for the smallpox patient. All right, well, let's, uh, that's smallpox. How about the patients with pneumonic plague? Well, then we use droplet precautions, which means you do standard precautions. Uh, put the patient in a private room, use a surgical mask if you're going to be, say, three to six feet of the patient. Great. Now, I don't think we need to go into detail about the mechanisms of spread then, uh, you know, and the droplet sizes with those two diseases, because uh, those are those are pretty much discussed at length yesterday uh, with Ted. Um, but John, you know, this is all great. Uh, you know, this is wonderful if we have a nice facility and we have all these private rooms or negative pressure isolation rooms to handle, you know, a whole boatload of plague or smallpox mm -hmm. patients. But what about that guy, that poor doc out there in the mud, or he's in a tent? What's he going to do? And you know, and if he's got a mass cow going on to boot? Well, as you heard the preventive medicine officer say in this scenario, you know, you have a number of patients that got a similar illness. Um, you can cohort isolate them together in the same tent or same ward. And it's, you know, if they all have the same disease, they're not going to give each other the same disease they already have. Well, that helps uh, certainly protect uh, uh, the other patients and the staff from getting the disease. But it also can be helpful from a logistics standpoint as well, I think. Exactly. If we need to use gowns or, you know, any kind of uh, materials in a field setting, they can be donned outside the ward where all the patients will be. And this might help save some of those expendable items, gowns and gloves and masks. You know, remember, um, in an austere setting, you know, your supplies may not be shipped in daily, so it's not unreasonable to consider assets in relation to patient care. But certainly don't hold back. If you need a new item, you know, a new gown or a, a mask, go get it. Uh, John, you know, I'm wondering if uh, some of the folks out in the audience might be asking whether, you know, does our M40 mask protect us from either a contagion patient or a BW release? What's the answer? Absolutely. If worn, you know, wear it right and make sure it's on before the exposure. All right. Well, let's say then we're under, you know, if we're under high threat of an attack, our medical providers mm -hmm. uh, might have to be in mop gear. I would uh, suspect it's probably pretty tough to take care of patients in mop gear, isn't it? Absolutely. Training. You know, it's nearly impossible to do a good patient assessment or you know a good exam when the care provider is wearing mop gear, you know it's even worse uh, when the patient's in mop gear as well. So what's the answer? Well, it brings up a subject of collective protection. Uh, they call it call pro. Basically, it's new items in the arsenal uh, that are being fielded. Um, positive pressure HEPA filtration systems that in effect give you a clean environment. You have to use standard and contact precautions inside, but you wouldn't need to wear mop gear while you were taking care of these patients. And it'll significantly improve your ability to do assessments and treat. Okay, one of the other diseases that may require special precautions uh, are the viral hemorrhagic fevers. And again, for the audience members out there, we talked about standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. There are airborne droplet and contact, and I think it's useful to keep in mind airborne for smallpox, droplet for plague, and contact for viral hemorrhagic fevers. Now, now John, you are our head nurse at the uh, Slammer, our own you know, BL4 patient care facility at USAMRID. You know, I know if you had a patient in there uh, with had, who had smallpox, let's say, uh, you'd probably take care of him in a spacesuit. Mm -hmm. So this all this talk is great uh, about you know uh, standard precautions, but you know you're using a spacesuit at USAMRID. Why are you trying to tell that poor guy out there in the mud that it's okay for him to do something different? Well, Mark, I'm not really sure. Either we like to look like cyanotic Pillsbury doughboys, or we just look so good in those blue suits. But I think it has to do with the level of care and the ability that we have at USAMRID. We have the luxury the flexibility, the time to make preparations and take precautions that we can use our blue suits for. We ensure the providers don't become infected. And, and that slammer, remember, uh, was built to handle miscellaneous lab infections. You know, and in the field, you have to use the best protection you can under the situation. And with proper use of standard precautions and transmission-based precautions, care providers just greatly diminish their risk of catching or disease from their patients. And there's good evidence, actually, that uh, field expedient measures are adequate. Uh, blue suits are not necessary for effective patient care. And I think uh, to get a perspective on that, it's useful to think of the Kikwit Zaire outbreak. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. Uh, the CDC was called in to assist. They went in. Uh, they didn't take any cure. They took simple garden variety hand washing gowns and gloves, and uh, the epidemic came to a screeching halt. I think you also have to remember uh, that the slammer is a two-bed unit. So if you've got two patients uh, that need care there, we're happy to help. 
help. If you have more, uh, then that's beyond our capabilities. Yeah, right. And uh, you know, here's really the take home message. You know, as nurses, medics, and physicians, we're trained to take care of patients, relieve their suffering, help them get better. But we can't help anybody if we become a casualty ourselves. We also can't help our patients if we're so scared that we give poor care and we don't take actions based on those fears. Yes, I know it's scary, but there's an awful lot we can do. Standard precautions, contact precautions, those precautions really do work for most agents. Um, and then one final point that I'd like to make, you know, when you show up in a blue suit or space suit, as far as I'm concerned, you can just see the patient's eyes get wide with fear. You know, it's important to anticipate that. And the best way around that is you have to communicate the best you can to your patient to try and take some of that fear out of there. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, John. On that note, uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, joining us here today on stage. Now, you'll still get to see John as he returns to the audience here shortly. Now, let's go on back to our uh, colleagues there at the 405th Cache and see how they're doing uh, in handling this BW attack. Sir, sir, may I talk to you? The nurses and the medics are exhausted. They're also scared. Do we need to decontaminate the patients or the ward? No, definitely not. They're already on um, definitive medications. We don't have to do any more. But, sir, we need to do something. Otherwise, our personnel are going to become casualties. Well, I understand that perfectly. But what do you suggest we do? Well, I'd like to call in the chaplain. He could come and debrief our people about the biological incident. Well, that's an excellent idea. And besides, the chaplain can help our people vent their frustrations and, and help them over the crises that they're involved. I'm also yeah. worried because we're really stacked up back here. I'm afraid our personnel are really going to get burned up before much longer unless we move some of these casualties out of here. Well, you're right. We'll have to call the medevac people. Excuse Remember, they're Excuse already on. Excuse me. Hang the phone. Yes. I'm the XO, 2nd Battalion. Half a Charlie company is missing. I have no idea where they are. I need to find out where these troops are. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot. I understand, sir. We will get to with you as soon as we can. We're very busy right now. If you can just be patient. You're busy. Be patient. You're busy. What do you think I'm doing? Sir. You're preparing for Sunday school? I've got some serious business going well, on we're here. Doing the best we got to get. Can. That's well, not. Look here, Major. You're bothering my chief nurse. We're very busy here. We've got a crisis. Now you sit, put your tail in that chair, and when we're ready for you, we'll call you. Understand? Now, where were we? Sir, we've got about five dead in our temporary morgue. What do we do with them now? Okay, put them on body bags, call the S4, uh, maybe they can get medevac to take them out of here. In the meantime, I'm gonna be back on the wards, okay? Well, uh, in that scenario, we've seen a lot of fear, confusion, and disorganized behavior in situations, in, you know, in this situation. And we've also seen it, of course, with situations involving bioterrorism. There's no doubt we have that potential in the field, you know, in a BW attack. Fortunately, we have with us today Dr. Harry Holloway. Welcome, sir. And he's a psychiatrist from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. And he has a specialty in human response to mass disaster situations. Well, once again, sir, welcome. And as you can see from our scenario, we've got personnel who are worried, they're arguing, they're pulling rank. It's really not a pleasant situation. Uh, what's going on? Well, number one, I think it's pretty much what you expect to happen in a situation where, where people are suddenly confronted uh, with uh, high demands. Uh, they're experiencing deaths of patients actively on the wards. They see uh, failure around them. They know they're short of resources. They're wondering what the diagnoses are. And so they're displaying the relatively normal behaviors that you expect to come forward in that, that circumstance. And the fact that they're normal doesn't mean that they aren't disruptive. Uh, the way you manage such behaviors, in part, is by preparing and the kind of training and getting through this course and going through various exercises. What you do is you prepare yourself for these events so that some of this, uh, if you will, expression is there. But, but let's face the fact that the arousal that goes along with the situation is gonna produce some of that behavior in any case. So we ought to be prepared to manage it and, and, and handle it. What about the triage situation? I don't want these uh, psychologically affected casualties gumming up my triage system as I'm attempting to deal with conventional injuries, chemical injuries, biological but injuries. It, in, in fact, triage, which I think is the heart of this, is one of the things you're learning to do, and learning to do it smoothly so that it works, is one of the ways you're going to be reducing stress. And, and of course, one of the things that's going to be happening here is the people who are emotionally upset even as was just pointed out by the person who was just speaking, isn't just going to be the people who are just the flakes, mm -hmm. but also the people who've got the infections. They're mm -hmm. going to come in emotionally upset too. Mm -hmm. So in the triage situation, you're going to have to be very clear about what you have to do medically. Because if there's any point I want to make about reducing stress in this situation that we've discovered again and again in disaster situations, providing upfront 
excellent, systematic medical care and making sure that people know they're getting that kind of care, that's the way you get rid of, of the lots of these fears and other things. On the other hand, for people who aren't, don't meet these they don't meet the right uh, definition for our case definition that we've been talking about here. Those people you may want to put aside, have them managed offline, not by these folks, because you've already been seeing evidence that you're overloaded. Mm -hmm. So why do you need more overload? Right, right. Yeah. Well, what about panic amongst my own troops? I don't want my own troops uh, uh, being affected as I'm requiring them to help me care for these patients. Anything well, I can do about that? Well, let's talk about panic first, because I think okay. that always gets to be a confusing, and whether it's with your own troops or the folks coming in, the one thing that you have to realize is that panic is a rare phenomenon, particularly among anyone who's trained. Sometimes you'll see panic, as you, we saw when the machine gun was introduced mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the 19th century or when the flamethrower was introduced in World War I, or the utilization of gas the first time, mm -hmm. but not the second time. Mm -hmm. Gas only produced panic the first time people were exposed to it. And now if we look at what happened at the Am Shirikyo attack in Tokyo, panic did not occur. People were scared but they went to doctors to try to get diagnoses. They behaved in systematic ways with regard to this. You did not see what is technically defined as panic, and I think we have to think about the technical division here, which is to lose one sense of one's kind of work role and rather go to a non-specific role in which escape is your primary activity or total inactivity and paralysis there. Now, with regard to your own troops, what you've done with them is you trained with them, you prepared them ahead of time that they may have to deal with this kind of circumstance, mm -hmm. and you begin to convey to them that you're going through a systematic process in this case that conveys to them that there are going to be ways they can behave that are successful. And that's one of the things here that we have emerging leadership principles. You really need to be a leader in this circumstance to convey that what they're doing is right, and if it isn't, correct it. Okay. What about the acute psychiatric casualty? How do I manage that casualty well, in an austere environment? The, the critical thing, number one, is as simply as possible. Okay. Do it up front, do it quickly, and what you're going to do with that casualty is, in so much as they're upset of the rest of that, get them on, give them, apply to everybody who's under this stress some mm -hmm. rest and replenishment. Okay. Let them go to a circum, uh, into a, a place where they can talk to somebody and maybe have, have a conversation about it. But basically, get the people who are the psychiatric casualties and assign them jobs. One of the critical things in the acute situation is to give people active roles to do things. One of the things you ought to be prepared to do in this circumstance is, in fact, what do you do with the extra help that comes from the people who come in who don't have the disease? What are they going to be doing? You're going to need help. Mm -hmm. You might as well start preparing to use them. And that's particularly applicable in the military situation, where we can really prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And in the civilian situation, it's even more critical where in fact the, there'll be numerous agencies responding and each of them may have to have ways of bringing people on board and managing them and directing them about what they can do that's useful in that circumstance. Hmm. We can see that in Oklahoma City, we can see it in other circumstances where this went on, where the agencies really were prepared to say, yeah, we need you to do this. And there's a, lots of hauling and pulling and simple tasks to do. Hmm. So Dr. Holloway, are there chronic problems that we've seen with some uh, actual incidents? Uh, if so, are there ways we could prevent those? Absolutely. There are some chronic problems, and yes, there are some things we can do to prevent them. I've already talked about some of them. Mm -hmm. One of the principal things we can do to prevent them is we can communicate how to respond effectively in this circumstance. How to respond effectively to biological attacks, how to manage the patients effectively, etc. That's one way, and by the way, from the doctor point of view, take really great care of the patients because one of the group, groups at most risk are the people who actually have the disease. They're really at most risk. So if we take good care of them, that's great. Another thing we can do on the chronic side to prevent the chronic problems uh, is uh, to not put people in situations where they're chronically helpless in this circumstance, but again, want to talk about what I, what I talked about before. Restore their autonomy, restore their health, and get them some role. Now, one of the things you also need to do is not apply psychiatric diagnoses in this upfront situation. Because labels given idly in this circumstance or diagnoses given idly are as dangerous to those who aren't sick as they are to those who are sick. So we must be very careful about that process because it will end up with a misattribution of illness and chronic problems down the line. Finally, there are gonna be some people who still have chronic problems. And those, that's the place where your psychiatrist can follow on in echeloning care in this circumstance. That can be done offline. It's not a part of your acute response, 
but that can be followed up and diagnoses as need to be made of the post-traumatic cases or the other cases can be made and care can be given and appropriate therapies introduced. But phasing your response and recognizing that the first thing you're doing up front is preserve the person's health. That's going to be really critical. Uh, Dr. Holloway, for, we, we have a lot of first responders in our audience today. And for the first responders out there, are there any special issues that they need to be made aware of? Well, th there, there are two, I think. And, and you've already talked about kind of one of them with regard to the biological warfare. Mm -hmm. But let me start off with the, the first kind of biological scenario where somebody says there's a device hooked up to a, uh, uh, a blower at a building and there's a suspicion that it's blowing anthrax throughout the building. Now, in that circumstance, what you're going to have is a group of first responders coming to that, that site. And we know from the first responders, again in Tokyo, that some of those were the bravest folks, mm -hmm. and they're also some of the people who died, mm -hmm. because they had tried to remove the sarin from the actual site, and they, they died uh, of, the, of the sarin poisoning. Mm -hmm. they, that's a critical kind of preparation that people need to have. That is how to protect their safety, how to enter that environment and feel safe, and how to make the distinction between that you've made here, because I've done several exercises in this area, between mm -hmm. infectious and, uh, and agents that are uh, contagious. Okay. That really is important. Okay. Then they, they, they have all of their safe behaviors, mm -hmm. and we also, as we bring them into that circumstance, we're already prepared to rotate them, give them time for rest, let them have, so that we don't get caught up in what I always think of as the MASH syndrome. Remember the, the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. television show MASH? My favorite show. Where, where <laughs> doctors never, never worked in uh, shifts at all. Mm -hmm. They just operated all the time. Well, if you rent a real mash that way, it'll last for about 72 right. hours, and then you can just wipe it off the map. Okay. So you've okay. got to rotate the task of these guys going into it. Okay. But there's another group of first responders, particularly in biological warfare, uh -huh. that must be prepared as first responders. They're called primary care docs. Right. Right. Because, particularly if you have a terrorist event in a civilian community, the first person, the person is going to go to with all these illnesses, these fevers, these nonspecific things that you've been talking about, the first person they're going to go to is their ordinary doc. Right, right. And that person must be prepared for their role as first responder. Mm -hmm. And they must make all of these same distinctions, and they must know how to activate things in a systematic way. Okay, so if you had one overall message to leave with people today, what would that message be? Uh, uh, the message would be, uh, number one, Put, through, put together scenarios that are realistic, play them out realistically, put together plans and play realistically. If you're going to bring stress management teams into this kind of area, play with them up front. Having a strange psychiatrist show up in your uh, phenomena that you've never seen before is uh, not going to work. Number one, because they've got to know about infectious right. disease control that you've been hearing about. They've got to know about these illnesses too. So integrate all of your care. Okay. But then finally, just one last point. Okay. I would say that don't forget that our job is to restore the autonomy of the patient, get their health back and, and going, and make sure that we've systematically prepared to minimize the damage that the bad guys want to do in this circumstance. Well, that's uh, useful information, Dr. Holloway. I want to thank you for joining us here today. I think that pretty much gets us through uh, what we wanted to cover today. Uh, we hope you found the issues that we've discussed useful and interesting and most of all helpful for you if you're ever faced with a biological warfare attack. And hopefully uh, none of you will ever need this training. But before we move on to questions from you in the audience, uh, let's go ahead and conduct a short review session. Hello, everybody. Today we took you through a BW scenario in the field. Remember those uh, Ten Commandments we talked about at the beginning? Well, as we progressed through the day today, we touched on each of those, although we may not have specifically mentioned them at the time. Now, in this scenario, we started off with a mass casualty situation, and we discussed biological weapon triage issues. And then as things began to look like an outbreak was occurring, we talked about surveillance issues, outbreak investigation, and epidemiologic clues to biological weapon attacks.
Okay, as the personnel in the 405th cache began to piece things together, we moved on to diagnosis, to treatment, to prophylaxis, and to infection control issues. And finally, we ended up with how to deal with the psychological aspects uh, of one of these situations. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We've certainly enjoyed the opportunity to present this information uh, on how to handle a biological warfare attack on the battlefield. We hope you found it useful. Tomorrow, the CDC will be hosting the program, which, we, which they've produced. The topic will be bioterrorism. For those of you in our audience who are non-military, you may find it directly more applicable to your needs. And for the military personnel watching, and especially the National Guard, we think it's useful for you to know how the civilian sector functions in case you need to help out in a large bioterrorism incident. Now, don't forget, you can receive continuing education credits for each day that you watch this broadcast, as long as you take the test. Remember, wait to take the test until you're done viewing the days of the program that you intend to view. And with that, I'll say good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Surgeon has requested I come to commend this unit for an outstanding job. Your quick recognition of a biological incident has saved countless lives. I'm personally very proud of all of you. Good luck with your next assignment. The president will be awarding a special citation for this unit. Whoa. Whoa.